Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to FYI, the For Your Innovation podcast. I'm Brett Winton. I direct the research team at ARC, and I have the pleasure of having Francis Pedraza with me here today. He is a great mind. He's the CEO of Invisible Technologies, which I'll let him describe in a second. And he's also been kind of a great informal resource for ARC and you know for the, for the whole team in terms of giving us a point of view on, on how he sees the technology landscape developing from his perspective as the CEO of a, of a emerging and quickly growing company. Hi, Francis. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. It's uh, an honor to be on the show and uh, to be a friend of the firm. Yeah. Well, we love having you. Could you tell us about Invisible? How did Invisible start? What does Invisible do? Have I interacted with Invisible before, do you think? So I'll start with what it does. So Invisible is ops as a service. We make it really easy to delegate any business process that you have at your company, whether it's something you're doing or your team is doing, or it's a you know business critical company-wide workflow. And uh, we use a combination of outsourcing and automation to run your process and bring down the price of running your process over time. So for example, insurance companies use us to process insurance claims. Banks use us to process invoices and do other back office processes. Food delivery companies use us to digitize restaurant menus. Real estate companies use us to scrape uh, online marketplaces to identify homes for them to, to buy. Um, individual executives use us to schedule their meetings or transcribe meeting notes. So you can use it for all kinds of different things. And um, what powers it behind the scenes is a t- technology we built we call a digital assembly line. So we coordinate 500 workers in 30 countries around the world who log in securely and our process builder takes our clients' custom processes and turns them into standard steps like Legos that we can optimize and reuse and automate. Uh, And so as we get more efficient at running your process, our margins improve and your unit price drops. So if it's an insurance company we're running claims for, you know, the price per claim will drop and drop and drop as we get more and more efficient. We automate more and more of it. So it's kind of like I mean, I remember maybe a decade ago when Mechanical Turk came out for Amazon, the idea that you would have little bits of labor that you could outsource to people across the internet and they would sign up and do it. It seems like you've kind of like packaged that and are providing it to entities that need something done. Uh, Is that the right way to think about it? Very good. Yeah. So um, there are traditional outsourcing companies. Uh, If you go back to the 1990s, there was this huge wave of, of outsourcing. And when banks in New York City, um, with labor in New York City, realized that they could take a bunch of processes and and you know create a an office in in New Delhi or in Manila. Um, you know thousands of jobs went offshore, um, and that was a wave. And then in the early two thousands, as you mentioned, Amazon thought, hey, what about uh, outsourcing for the internet? And they built Mechanical Turk. And if you could break down a process into very small steps like identifying cats in images, you know, you could run it at web scale. Uh, and so Mechanical Turk was one of the sort of was outsourcing for the internet was, was sort of a big idea in the early 2000s. Um, fast forward to today, the problem with outsourcing is that outsourcing firms bill you by the hour. And when you bill by the hour, your incentive is to be as inefficient as possible without getting fired. Um, you don't have an incentive to automate. And so that's on that's outsourcing on the one hand. So you have all these dinosaurs from the 1990s that aren't tech companies. And then on the other hand, you have all these new exciting automation tools coming out. UiPath just IPO'd. There's a lot of uh, robotic process automation tools that are hitting the market. There's also 
tools called no code tools, no code automation, and just in general, different software point solutions. So if there's an app for everything, if there's an automation tool for everything, how come everything isn't automated yet? How come everything isn't perfect yet? And uh, the answer is that all these solutions have costs. So you're going to set up these tools. Each tool may be able to help you automate 5% of your overall operations. But at the end of the day, you still have an in-house ops team or you're still outsourcing. So with Invisible, it's kind of like Salesforce coming in and saying no software. We're coming in and saying no automation tools. Just use Invisible. We'll run it end to end. And we've built like this, you know, futuristic virtualized BPO on the internet that combines outsourcing and automation. We use like 200 third-party tools. We build our own tools and it's sort of an end-to-end -end solution. Yeah, I'm really intrigued just generally with the idea of designing technologies that are successfully backward compatible. And I feel like a lot of, you know, as, as someone who says, oh, this technology is going to work, this one isn't. A lot of the focus we have from a forecasting perspective is kind of what is the implementation path that will actually work here as opposed to the way that things should be set up. It seems like part of the role you're fulfilling is providing kind of like the backward compatibility to outsource processes, as you said, and then a trajectory that allows them to kind of improve and become more automated over time. Is that an accurate description of it? And then you might ask yourself, well, why? why aren't most products built this way? And it's interesting to sort of reverse engineer why. Most software companies are trying to get their users to enter the walled garden. You know, if you rebuilt all your processes from scratch using our, our new system, our new tool, our new widget, they would be perfect. And they create a sort of like utopia uh, where uh, everything would, would be perfect in theory. But in practice, you know, you're dealing with messy operations and, and businesses that are sometimes decades old, sometimes they're new, but they, there's always some custom thing about the business that makes it not work in your perfect wall garden. So like, why does that exist as a dynamic? And I think a lot of technology companies are building for the investor instead of building for the customer or the client. So when Invisible went to raise money, there were three big dogmas that we ran into that VCs like didn't want to invest in Invisible because of these three things. The first was, we were a um, service, not a product. Um, so it was technology enabled services instead of a product. And the idea is that Silicon Valley is like a hammer and everything's a nail. You know, Silicon Valley likes selling software as a service. They like selling uh, apps where there's no um, service component whatsoever. It's just selling the product. But then you create a world where there's like more and more tools, more and more apps, but then you have all these usage costs. So the thought was, all right, you know, if Uber drives cars for you, who's going to drive apps for you? You know, who's going to who's going to actually use all these tools? So that's the first thing. The second thing was that we had humans in the loop instead of being pure software. And then the third was we were horizontal instead of picking one vertical. We, you know, invisible could be used for insurance and for financial services and for logistics and for healthcare and for sales and for marketing and for data obviously so many different use cases instead of just picking one. Investors love having a clear product market fit, like insurance uh, operations would have been a much easier business for them to sort of get comfortable around the risk and the product market fit for than sort of uh, it could be used for anything. And we don't know what the biggest vertical is going to be. And, uh, and the idea of scaling human operations, like hiring thousands of people around the world and all these different regulatory environments and managing and coordinating humans was like a nightmare to them. And then the idea of just it not being a, a SaaS product, uh, you know, all those things were just non-starters. But I think that the irony of paying the um, contrarian tax for so many years is that, you know, by, by swimming upstream, you get to the other end and there are no competitors and people have like a structural disincentive to compete with you because investors will, will sort of penalize them for those same same dogmatic reasons. There's like a lot of things I want to kind of dig into there. First of all, like from the investor perspective, it does seem like, gosh, I mean, if you can do everything, how do you know who to sell to? Or how do you like tip of the spear your sales organization into uh, an opportunity? So like having a horizontal strategy for one thing, you're growing very quickly now uh, and clearly successful. Um, but how do you even know kind of what to go after next? Yeah, I remember our first uh, board meetings after we got our first venture dollars a few years ago. You know, the pressure was all around picking a vertical. And our biggest company uh, client at the time was an insurance company. And we we're doing things like claims processing, policy services work, underwriting checks. 
And the thought was, all right, let's just go focus on that and sort of forget about everything else. But I sort of held the line of like, hang on, we're at the beginning of time from the point of view of the company's history. We don't know what the big use cases are going to be. Let's try to sell to other insurance companies, but let's also keep an open mind. And then, you know, we ended up getting introduced to one of the big food delivery companies. And in 2020, that obviously was, that company had a supply shock and a demand shock. All of their overseas outsourcing vendors in Manila, New Delhi, et cetera, had to shut down their offices because of coronavirus. And so they they lost sort of outsourcing support. Meanwhile, every restaurant was changing their menu and every restaurant was joining their platform. And so Invisible went all the way to the CEO's desk and there was like an urgent need of like, can you take over all of this tomorrow? We literally have our engineers doing this manual work, uh, not with code, uh, because we need to operate. And so that ended up being a golden opportunity for us. And then we went and, you know, sold to other food delivery companies and grocery delivery companies and logistics companies, sort of like an amoeba looking for sugar. You know, you take an agnostic approach and you sort of let the market guide you and you sort of have an explore function and an exploit function. Explore function is you're talking to new verticals, you know, having new conversations, new use cases, and you see where they go. And then once you find one that's a clear fit and you've got a you got a win, you have a success story, you replicate and replicate and replicate and replicate. And that actually, you know, not only makes the sales cycle more efficient, but it makes the operational and automation cycle more efficient because you're reusing automations, you're reusing processes. So it's sort of, um, you know, you kind of build a war machine on the exploit function, but you, you stay agnostic. Because when I started the company... I had never even thought of insurance claims. Like, you know, uh, never thought about like digitizing restaurant menus. There's all these, I, I had no idea. I just, I just had one, one insight, which is. Well, yeah. what, so, what was the genesis? Why, why in this <laughs> So I get asked that question so much that I, I joke that I was sitting under a tree and a process hit me on the head. My first company, Everest, was an iPhone app to help people achieve personal goals. So think about like Instagram, but for your goals. And it ultimately failed as a company. Uh, we had half a million people download it and use it. And we won all these design awards and Apple loved it and featured it a lot. But uh, people would put a lot of goals on there and post a lot of activity and make a lot of progress. And then after about six months, they would quit. <laughs> and there's a reason why gyms don't make money when people get fit. They make money when people want to get fit. And Amazon doesn't make money when people actually read the books. They make money when they want to read the books, they buy the books. They divorce their business models from retention. And so we had a business model where brands like North Face and Quicksilver would, would sponsor different categories of, of goals. And that model you know, required us to retain people and have not people have not have people quit. So it was sort of like uh, three plus years of my life wasted in a sense because of a, a business model. Oops, you know the business model didn't work. Um, so I took some time off to travel and I got a, a bunch of job offers at like big tech companies, but I wasn't ready to go work for the man yet. I wanted to do another company, but I I wanted to be more humble about like what the what the new idea was. So I actually ran a brainstorm community called Cheeky. And I asked all my smart friends to share startup ideas. They didn't have time to start. And uh, like, if you had an idea in the shower and be like, oh, that'd be a cool company. I'll never have time to start it. Share it with me. And I would edit these and publish one every day. And I'd say, okay, Brett's, Brett's got a new idea for insurance or uh, Allie's got a new idea for a moving company or whatever. And I'd publish these. And for, for about a year, I published hundreds of ideas and then the community, would, if they liked the idea, they would respond and we'd do brainstorm threads over email. And I had this thought at one point towards the end, I'm like, gosh, there's an app for everything. You know, how come everything isn't perfect yet? And uh, it sounds like an odd question. You know, there's an app for everything. How come everything isn't perfect yet? But um, it sort of became like a koan and it got, it helped me discover the work of this economist named Ronald Coase, who was really futuristic. Uh, you know, in, in the 1920s and 30s, he was asking questions like, how come one company doesn't do all things? Um, like if you have a like one source of hyper competence, like Ford Motor Company, how come Ford Motor Company, well, okay, if they can go from cars to tractors and tractors to airplanes in World War II, like why couldn't they just also do theme parks. Like why does Disney exist as well as Ford? And so he discovered all of these uh, without going into his full theory, which is, which is, you know, large and would be a major rabbit hole. He did discover these like frictional costs, things like switching cost, integration cost, discovery cost, usage costs, coordination costs, that these are frictions that exist between supply and demand 
that sort of describe why the shape of things exists as they do. And so the insight for me was, gosh, Silicon Valley is mass producing tools, but people only have 24 hours in a day. You can't actually use all of the apps and that, that exist. And so when I started Invisible, it was actually a different business model than we have today. It was a $10,000 a month service for CEOs only. And the idea was we were going to provide the most elite executive support you could possibly get. Because instead of hiring one executive assistant, you'd have our whole team and we'd specialize and build technology behind the scenes and give you like an Iron Man suit, kind of like, you know, presidents and heads of state and fortune, you know, 100 CEOs have like the $10 million a year A team. It's almost like the CIA or the NSA, but for, for your personal productivity, that was our initial pitch. And we thought nobody would buy it, but we were wrong. There's a ton of demand. We had like five clients in the first two weeks and a wait list. But the problem was the CEOs delegated so aggressively that, you know, we were working nights and weekends and we hired a team of 20 people and we were spending 20k for every 10k we were making a revenue um, we were we we had raised like some money really quickly and we like spent all of it in six months we raised like you know half a million dollars and we'd run out of money in six months and so we had to pause all of those clients and most of the team left um and basically it was like a crisis you know uh near-death experience but one of our clients needed us so much that he paid us $100,000 up front to keep the lights on. Um, and he'd become dependent even in those six months on the service. And so then there were, there were um, three brave engineers and two operations people who, even though I couldn't keep paying them a salary, they just refused to quit and they work for equity. And so for over a year, we worked on that one company and we built 50 processes to support that company. And we built our first process architecture. We built our first version of the digital assembly line. And we pivoted from executive support to basically being a process assistant, being able to run any process, no matter what it was for any function of the business. And we relaunched. And then after we relaunched, that model worked and grew very quickly. And, you know, there was a lot of iteration along the way, but eventually, you know, Invisible 2.0 is, is uh, the company we are today. You still do the executive assistant stuff or is that? We do. It's just a smaller percentage of our revenue. It's a profitable business line for us, but it's like, you know, less than 5% of our revenue and uh, it's growing. It's just inherently, I think of it like an R&D lab because, you know, let's just say an executive wants you to purchase a flight because they're going on a business trip to Tokyo. You got to get that done quickly and perfectly and you're buying one ticket. You're not buying a thousand tickets, right? But if you're digitizing restaurant menus, there's like 10,000 menus need to be digitized this week. Um, so it's just a, as, as a business, it's far more difficult. There are a lot of job functions that there's a portion of the job function that is like therapists, psychologists, like financial advisors are, are mostly therapists, I think, right? And those, and so conceptually, the idea of like a robo advisor, like a company that does the asset allocation for you, so you no longer need a financial advisor. Theoretically, it sounds good, but actually, like there is customization in kind of like the way in which communication happens that people have a hard time getting over that hump. It seems like kind of the executive assistant type stuff. It's, you know, everybody has their own, like, not just preferences, but ways in which they prefer to be checked in on, on like what exactly they need and stuff. It seems like that would be hard to like make it feel cohesive to people, but you're still doing it. So it's, it's interesting enough. But uh, consistent with what you're saying, it works best in situations where there is an actual executive assistant who is playing the therapist role. Um, they're like the human interface. They are the Iron Man suit for the, the executive. And then that person then can offload their back office to us. They can say, all right, here are the 12 processes that I do for Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, the busy executive. And I've laid them all out. I just don't want to do them anymore. And so I can, I can sort of focus on, on being on basically the service aspect of the job. And that has, has been our most successful model because the busy executive does not have time to uh, they have time to think about what they want and get it, you know, delegate. They don't have time to turn their delegation into a process, lay out all the instructions and make sure the work is done right. <laughs> so that's where the exec the EA steps in. That's funny. So it's actually the, you tried to like replace the executive assistant and said you provide the automation function behind the executive ass assistant who's still like the front facing person in the relationship. 
It's yeah. interesting. Which is one of the reasons why when I hear all this doom and gloom about jobs going away, I kind of roll my eyes or uh, bite my lip. Or <laughs> okay, so we covered, that was some of covering like the horizontal side. How about that? You say you're basically, you feel like you're in competitive white space. How do you contrast yourself or compare yourself to like the likes of UiPath and kind of those more kind of automation focused companies? Like, is there a different spot that you think you're going to occupy? I mean, you're smaller than them now, but like lay out what you're seeing in the competitive space a little bit and, and how you all plug in. Yeah. So I think that, um, all of these RPA tools and no-code tools and automation tools are part of our stack. We have 200 different tools in our stack that we can use. And, and any anytime we discover a new third-party tool that fits in, we'll just slot it in and use it as we'll basically be a customer of theirs. And when they upgrade their features, we benefit from the upgrade. We also build our own automation tools, but only when there's no third-party tool, when there's a lacuna or like, so, you know, some, some void in the market and, and there's an opportunity for us to drive margins on a client. The thing about thinking about things from the customer's point of view, a customer who fully sets up UiPath maybe can automate 5% of their overall operations. And there's all these setup costs, and then there's like a marginal return. And the ROI make may make sense, but what are they going to do with the other 95%? Um, and so there are many approaches that you ultimately you know can apply within any you know, complex operational setting and no one tool will solve for every approach. And then there are things that just can't be automated yet, at least, or can't be automated with the tools that exist in the market yet. So Invisible just focuses on our whole platform exists to sort of deliver that end to end solution and uh, to the client on the front end, and then to align incentives around driving down the unit cost from there using third party tools and using our own. So that agnostic approach means that we're totally not threatened by, you know, automation players. Um, but it also allows us to be an automation player ourselves, but only sort of pick our shots um, on, when, when we're building our own tech behind the scenes. The, the tech that we focus on, so instead of building our own RPA technology, we focus on building a process builder, which I think of like a spinal co column. We take our clients' custom processes and turn them into standard steps. And so that was an insight that custom consists of standard. The idea that any process you run uh, that's a you know repetitive instruction-based workflow can be turned into like little Legos that you know could exist in our step library. And so we think of what we're doing as sort of sequencing the enterprise process genome, where once you've once you've automated a step for a uh, real estate company, that same step may be reusable doing lead generation for a startup. The two companies might have you know, very different processes, but that one step may be in common. And so you get the, the benefits of building a library like that. And by focusing on that sort of middle layer, the, the layer of, you know, the digital assembly line, which coordinates labor uh, and allows us to deliver an end-to-end -end solution and the process builder that structures the work and allows us to plug in automation tools and build our own. Uh, I think we've, we've basically built a roadmap that is orthogonal to all the other tech companies. It seems like it, like often clients must not know what processes they're actually doing, or it's kind of like clearly like the client, you know, clients in different verticals won't know that, oh, this little piece fits with this other little piece. But also like if you're approaching a potential client, it's like they, there's probably a lot of things that they think that they can't efficiently outsource. And in fact, they might not even know exactly how it happens inside their own organization. How do you like drill through that or is there is there a way to drill through that or, or or what is the kind of like sales friction i would imagine that's it maybe it's not even that yeah know. when things are working it's sometimes hard to isolate variables and understand why they're working so uh it took us you know um a while to get to a one mil run rate we, we we got there in 2019 and then last year we got to a three mil run rate it was an incredible year in 2020 for us because our business model was sort of long volatility. Um, even clients that had to lay off a lar large part of their workforce ended up spending more with us because they needed the work to get done uh, and they just had fewer people to do it. And then clients that were hiring more to keep up with demand also um, just had more work to do. Um, so they ended up sort of spending more with us. And when there's volatility, processes are changing. So processes changing also results in, in, in innovation. So 2020 was a big year for us and we tripled and we thought, you know, in 2021, we would maybe double and our growth rate would slow down. We're on track for a 5x plus revenue growth year this year. And that is like 
you know, driven by a number of factors. Part of it is our operations has gotten to the point where we haven't had a client churn because of quality in I think a year. It's been a long time. Like we've we've really doubled and tripled down on quality as the best business model, um, to quote Pixar. And so there's there's some operational excellence um, there and and sort of customer success excellence there. And that's the sort of athletic elements that, you know, VCs don't like to talk about because, you know, it's not necessarily technology, but the organization needs to mature and is a machine. You know, um, there's that old, uh, I think it was a Toyota CEO where he says, well, what do we do? It's like, we build the factory that builds the factory that builds the cars and that's the company. Um, So, so that's, that's uh, the operational excellence component, but other, other reasons I think, you know, that we have been able to sort of find the use case is this, you know, explore exploit function. Like once you identify a major industrial use case and you've done it for significant logo uh, and you can name drop the logo, then, you know, all their competitors are suddenly interested and you can, you can sort of speak their, their language. And then lastly, when you're losing money, for example, an auto company came to us and said, we're losing X million dollars on warranties fraud. And it becomes a sort of urgent, it goes in that urgent, important quadrant, like efficiency is kind of a, a nice to have during peacetime. But then eventually you end up with a bottleneck that is gating the whole company and it goes into a whole different sort of, sort of decision-making purchase process. And, uh, and, th- and that's a situation where they will tell you what the, what the problem is. It's just a question of whether you can solve it. Yeah. It seems like, I mean, you describe yourself as being long volatility, but clearly, I mean, I think volatility is tamped down. Maybe not. There's a lot of noise in the business landscape right now, but you're growing even faster. Like, do you have a, I mean, clearly you're anniversarying, like, growth in 2020, but do you think that your clients are still kind of adapting to, oh, this is what the new world looks like, or that you've just crossed a threshold where it's like, oh, you have a good operations and sales team in place where you're just finding a lot of opportunity. It's like idiosyncratic to to visible. Yeah. So last month was our first officially profitable month. uh, And we, we are at a nine mil revenue run rate. And we got to that point with to salespeople. And so that is a testament to expansion as the primary driver of what we do, which is, again, going back to something we were talking about earlier, sometimes the worst thing about your business model becomes the best thing about your business model. It's like a double-edged sword or two-sided coin. Like the thing that's so great about Invisible from an expansion point of view is a company comes to you with like some burning need, urgent, important need, and you solve that problem for them and you do it well. And then they sort of they have the light bulb moment later on and they're like, oh, ops is a service. So wait, if you could solve this problem, can you solve this problem? And then you solve that problem. And then you solve the second one, you solve the third one, solve the fourth one. And pretty soon you're, you're supporting five different teams in, in seven different geographies and, and you know, you're running 16 processes and, and the, the you know, $2,000 a month account has turned into a $20,000 a month account or $50,000 a month account. And it's, you're driving efficiency across all these processes and they're seeing the unit costs drop. And so the CFO likes it and, and the, the COO likes it because he's solving problems and the CTO likes it because the, the back, the roadmap backlog, you know, is shrinking and he's able to deliver solutions faster. So it just, you know, it works in that delayed way. But, the you know, we sometimes use the metaphor of, you know, finding, uh, all the carbon in the world. It's like there's carbon in rocks and there's carbon in trees and there's, there's carbon in all these places and or, or sort of like an oil miner metaphor. It's like, you know, there's some of the oil that's near the top of the ground, but there's all this oil deep down. You got to do some fracking. And so operations is like that. Like, you know, as a, most CEOs have no idea what the true operational complexity of their business is. There's no way that Jeff Bezos actually understands how Amazon works. Uh, I don't understand how Invisible works. Like, you know, operations becomes complex really quickly. And there's all this work that comes out of the woodwork when uh, you create a, a flexible custom, you know, solution that, you know, can kind of work for anything. And, you know, that's how you sort of the customers have to teach you what the use cases are. But then, you know, um, uh, you can you can replicate. Well, okay. So for one thing, why are you profitable? You are following the wrong model. You haven't read the venture capital blitz scaling playbook. You should be, if you're growing this quickly, you should be as unprofitable as possible. No? Like what's the point of generating cash flow at this point? Shouldn't you be raising a mega round and everything else? We're actually doing the opposite. So if most, most companies are in this um, alphabet soup treadmill where the goal of is to get to a series seed and then the goal is to get to a series a and a series b and a series c and a series d 
uh, and it's sort of a coursus honorarum of like, you know, you get, you, you, you write home to mom. It's like, Hey mom, look, uh, I'm in TechCrunch. Hey mom, look, I'm in the wall street journal. You know, I raised another round and, uh, I find these, these sort of metrics, um, not only myopic, but uh, funny, um, because, you know, the amount of equity capital raised is a measure of inefficiency. Like you should be ashamed that you like raised a hundred million dollars in equity capital. (laughs) You shouldn't be like proud of it. So uh, we're going the other way, which is instead of anchoring towards an IPO or an acquisition, we're trying to use, we're trying to actually buy back all of our investors over time and uh, use uh, using a combination of profits and debt to do it. Now, this won't make sense for most businesses, but um, you know, I think it made sense from first principles for ours. And I'll sort of try to walk you through the, lo- the sort of strategic logic for us. We did a forecast uh, where we realized that we could make all the hires we need to make through the rest of this year and through the rest of next year and increase comp by 55% on average per person and do all of that and throw off um, up to 5 million of operating profit next year. When we're talking about were large numbers at the time. We were 30 people at the company. We were going to go to 50 by the end of this year, which we're on track for. And then by the end of next year, we were thinking we'd grow to 70 to 80 people. In other words, over the course of the 18 month period, like, you know, 2.5 Xing the size of the company, like, you know, very large growth. Now, could we have grown even faster? Is it possible to grow from 30 people uh, instead of 30 to 70? You can grow or 30 to 70, 30 to 80. Could, could we have grown from 30 to 120 um, uh, or 150 and not been profitable? Yes, but you're taking on unbelievable cultural risk uh, and you're changing incentives in the process. So there's a veterancy element that um, you know most people don't think about. Like onboarding at a company isn't just something that the HR team does. It's something that like happens around the water cooler, so to speak. Like you learn from the people that have been at the company a long time. Now, when more than half the company is brand new at the company, you know, basically the company's organizational memory collapses or shrinks. It's like, you know, uh, everything is being built from scratch. So you don't get the evolutionary muscle muscles and memory that you you would you would normally get um but when you are growing at a healthy pace you get that sort of optimal mix of like the new dna and the new energy and the the young pup energy but also you get the old wise dogs who are like you know putting everyone in line and and and, and teaching them how things get done and so you're not sort of reinventing the wheel and, and learning new problems so i think that uh or you maybe a different metaphor the speed of the car it's like it's it's safe and optimal to get to your destination it's you're taking healthy risk when you're driving at 70 miles an hour but you're taking unhealthy risk when you're driving at 120 miles an hour and so it's like you know you just don't want to drive the car faster than that so i'll stop with that as like a a, a consideration yeah th- there's that charlie munger quote show me the incentives i'll show you the outcome and um, you know, most startups end up with 70% of their company owned by investors, 30% of the company owned by the team, but the majority of that's owned by the founders. So most of the actual employee, and then they're hiring as many people as they can. They're going with the 30 to 150 plan. So the slice of the pie, number of slices is increasing, but the size is just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So everyone's incentives are aligned around a $10 billion IPO and quit. So it's, it's similar to the types of incentives that got us into the 2008 financial crisis. Like people are incentivized to take massive risks um, as long as it gets them to an IPO so they can sell and get liquidity. The incentives are not true entrepreneurial ownership incentives. These are not the types of behaviors you would get if you owned, um, if, you were, if you were, say, the true owner of the company. If you, if you were the founder and CEO of the company, you wouldn't necessarily do these things. If you owned a significant percentage of the company, you would do these things. But you know, when everyone's incentives are built around an IPO, people just start doing crazy things. Yes, and um, a company that does three hundred million in sales is both more exciting to try to manage. I think, well, maybe not more exciting, but at least like it's more power. And uh, getting there quicker while there's a window of opportunity would seem like it gets kind of like the organization into a stance where it's at least impact on the world is greater rather than not like so is there a future state where it's kind of like oh we do need to invest where you would go back to the kind of capital markets or back to the venture capitalists and and raise again uh and this just happens to be like growth is so fast that you can't pot 
you can't safely support it with he- with headcount growth at this time, but you might return? Or do you think that this is like a, yeah, we're buying out the investors and Invisible is going to be a, you know, partnership effectively going forward? Right. So, so there's different ways of thinking about where the dollars are going. So if the dollars are going towards sales, customer success, operations, marketing, those all have very clear ROI. Um, so uh, sales hire is the classic one and easiest to think about. You should be able to model out the payback period of hiring a salesperson. Um, you know, you, you're going to lose money on their salary for the first few months, and then they, you know, either they're going to cut it or not. They're going to meet their quota or they're not. And if they meet their quota, then um, they're going to pay you, you know, back at say month three or month four or month five or month six. And after that, it's it's sort of gravy and and incentives take over, and it's and, it, and it's um, it's all up from there. And once you've hired enough salespeople and you can really model out all those economics, there's no need for capital per se. It's working capital. It's it's very similar to like accounts receivable growing. You need to finance your accounts receivable, but it's a cash flow problem. You don't actually need to like lose money doing hiring. You should never lose money scaling a sales team. Um, you just have a working capital problem if you want to scale it really fast. But if you prematurely scale it, like you don't know what your business model is and you hire way too many salespeople and they all run a loss and you, it just doesn't work out because you didn't know what the economics were, then then yeah, you're going to run a loss. So I think there's a similar thing with all of these roles that are tied to revenue in some way. So marketing, sales, customer success, operations, all have characteristics like I just described. So I don't think equity capital is the right way to finance any of those once you've gotten your business figured out. I think that on the engineering tech product side, um, yes, you can you could, can use equity capital, but similarly there you run into a different problem, which is the, the mythical man month problem, where um, you know hi, it's like you can't hire nine women to have a baby in one month. It just doesn't work. Um, so you can grow an engineering team to some optimal size, um, but you can't grow it absolutely. Like, um, you know, just because revenue five X's doesn't mean your engineering team should five X or that engineering growing the size of the engineering team five X will result in a five X increase in velocity. None of that is true. So actually Scott, our CTO is a very rare CTO because he has a lot of business experience and I've pushed him to think, to structure our products as financial risk products, where each product manager, so we have Chris running the uh, client portal and Seb running the digital assembly line and agent pay and all of our infrastructure, and Joe managing our process builder. And each of those product managers, instead of having a PL per se, they basically, every additional engineer we give them does have a kind of ROI math associated with it. And it's much harder to do that, but at least there's accountability and some financial discipline. And there's not a, you know, a huge amount of, um, well, anyways, we're able to finance that internally with profits. And I don't think, again, I don't think this, the sort of, the sort of behaviors that would occur if we used all of our profits, like in terms of, if we just hired more engineers and product managers and threw more money at, at the wall would result in like better decision-making environment. As a matter of fact, Keeping profits as the North Star anchors everything. So, you know, one of the reasons why we became profitable is we tied our salaries to profits. And so it turns out when people get get paid more money, when the company's more profitable, all these little behave it's like having it's like having a manager in the room when you're not there, right? Because like that's the power of incentives. And so so lo and behold, everyone's salaries are tied to profits, the company becomes profitable. Are we gonna get a, get rid of that now? No, guess what? Like 15% of all profits moving forward are gonna get paid out as a bonus. Right. That leaves the, uh, you know, um, the rest, um, the other 85% of the profits for us to use for buybacks and reinvesting in the company. So the reinvestments are run in an ROI driven fashion. Uh, it's very similar to what Warren Buffett did at Berkshire Hathaway, where he had all his business unit CEOs generating profits and throwing money back to headquarters. And then headquarters would sit around and say, okay, like we're going to write checks, but each check is going to be tied to some ROI math. And so that's sort of what our management team is doing internally in funding internal projects. How do your investors feel about this? And also you have like a huge Rolodex. Don't you have like venture capitalists being like, are you sure? How did those relationships evolve? in this scenario? So people uh, don't think very much about cost of capital. I do have a large Rolodex and I do have VCs that are interested in investing and I've had turned down offers and I like to remind them of the cost of capital. So 
let's just say I raise $10 million at $100 million valuation. People forget that if I take the company to 10 billion, which is why the VC is investing in the first place, that 10 million costs $1 billion. That's a very expensive $10 million. That's like unbelievably expensive. And if I could raise that 10 million in debt, even if that debt three X's, which is like very, very expensive debt over the same period, that 10 million turns into 30 million. It doesn't turn into to a billion dollars. Um, so when you start thinking about things from a cost of capital point of view, like venture capital is the is like t- almost toxic from a true expense of capital point of view. The other the other thing is that it, it reduces your strategic flexibility. Like the model is really built around the IPO or the acquisition, but we we ended up going in a very very different direction in our thinking. So I'm going to briefly sketch for the first time in public something that I'm very very proud um, to announce actually, which is that. We, we negotiated with our board and our board, I give them a ton of credit for being open-minded um, uh, and doing something that none of us have heard of other startups doing, um, which is they authorized me to continue to use buybacks. We did a buyback uh, earlier this year, and now we're going to continue to do them moving forward. So we're going to provide liquidity to investors, particularly angel investors first. Uh, we, we raised a bunch of, we raised about half of our money from angels. So they're going to, they're going to get an exit or the opportunity to exit. A percentage of those buybacks are going to go directly to the employee stock option pool to empower us to hire more people. So that's dilution that the remaining investors would otherwise have to take because they would have to grow the employee stock option pool themselves, but instead they're not. And the rest will be accretive to everyone. So when you do buybacks, you reduce the denominator. So everyone owns more after a buyback. So that's the first pillar of the deal. The second thing that we we did is we created a performance-based employee stock option plan. So people uh, forget that one of the reasons Elon is the richest man in the world is not just because he uh, provided all that initial capital to Tesla and SpaceX, but because he had that famous deal where he negotiated with the board for his $1 salary, but his like moonshot goals that the board said, all right, if you achieve these things we think are impossible, we'll give you the biggest payment package in the history of mankind. Um, So we did a similar thing, except I was negotiating instead of for myself, almost like a trade unionist, I was negotiating for the team. And I said, hey, look, you know, if we get the company to 120 20 million of trailing 12 month revenues. Uh, and there'll be milestones along the way, you know, starting at 10 million of trailing 12 month revenues going all the way up throughout the point, we will trigger awards, but the combined award will be 20% uh, more into the employee stock option pool. And so by the end of it, the partnership, which we call our employees partners, the partnership will own more of the company, a larger percentage of the pie. But from an investor point of view, they're getting like, just keep the numbers simple. They're getting like 12x appreciation in exchange for 20% dilution. So it's just the n- net accretion, uh, the appreciation net of dilution is just amazing for them. So they're happy with it. We're happy with it. And then the last thing, which I think is like the coup de grace of the whole like incentive framework that we 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 created, is that you know most cap tables, cap t- you know m- the equity of most companies ends up looking like a gerontocracy. Um, because who owns the company? Oh, somebody who used to work here five years ago, 10 years ago, he still owns like 3% of the company. Who owns the company? Ah, this guy who invested, you know, four or five years ago or six years ago or 10 years ago. But um, we are doing almost like a private IPO um, where partners will be able to sell back their stock to the company, even if they're still at the company. But after they leave, they'll only be able to hold their stock for a maximum of I'll just say three years until they have to sell the company back their their stock. Um, But this creates a scenario where, you know, let's just fast forward 10 years from now, as close to 100% of Invisible will be owned by the team that's building Invisible. And so if you think about that in terms of forward thrust, the motivational power unleashed is just extraordinary. It becomes an overwhelming strategic advantage compared to most companies that are pursuing the IPO or the acquisition path. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's actually, it sounds similar to a lot of financial or asset management firms align incentives in that way where you have a partnership where there's, you know, you have to sell back into the partnership. And so then, um, you know, people are aligned to like build the business better, better not take, you know, inordinate amounts of risk on behalf of the business. It's exciting. The team must be excited by all this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Charlie Munger, show me the incentives. I'll show you the outcomes. I think there's a, the, the mission and vision of the company has always inspired people to join. 
But we, I always wanted to build a company where even if I wasn't the CEO, I would want to join. And one of our mantras is like, you know, you're the CEO of your area until told otherwise. And we've tried to like kind of build the Avengers. It's like, well, instead of going and being a Superman and starting your own company, a superwoman starting your own company over there, why don't we get all the Superman and Superwomen together under one team and see what we can do together? That sounds great as a sort of romantic story, but it's very hard to build an ownership culture without the actual ownership, right? It, it becomes like employer branding increasingly trends towards a lie, unless you actually like, you know, really do something about it. And, uh, and this was the sort of financial engineering necessary to like put our money where our mouth was, or, or in this case, put our equity where our mouth was. Seems like a couple of times you've talked about basically like crossing the skis of, of venture capital orthodoxy. Is that partly a reaction to like your experience building Everest and what went on there or how, you know, how do you end up in that stance where you're comfortable kind of being like, well, this is, you know, this doesn't make sense from first principles. So let's do it in another way. Do you have, have mentors you rely on? Like, how do you end up in that spot? I do have really great mentors and coaches. As a matter of fact, I, I'm incredibly, for, first of all, I, I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's ever invested in me. Uh, my first, you know, Everest, I, I actually took that loss very heavily and very personally. Like I raised almost $3 million from people like Peter Thiel and Bono and spoke to lots of investors that said no and a few that believed and said yes, or were willing to take a bet and said yes. And it was a big bet zero at the end of the day. And so part of the reason I ended up going towards profitability is I just don't want the psychological trauma of, of you know, uh, Sun Tzu said, don't worry about victory, remove the possibility of defeat, and then afterwards, look for victory. And so, so yes, I mean, I think that formative experience with Everest definitely did sort of traumatize me in a way where I was, I was oriented differently. I think that my best investors and my, my, my mentors and coaches have pushed me to think from first principles and to be contrarian. Um, so one of our investors, Doug Clinton, I think it's out now, called the contrarian mindset. And um, he says that, you know, if you want consensus, consensus strategies yield consensus outcomes, right? You're going to be on a bell curve, right? And if you just do what everyone else is doing, you're going to do more or less as well as everyone else. So if you want an extraordinary outcome, you have to be extraordinarily divergent in your thinking. Well, how do you do that? And you do that by developing a sort of intellectual muscle of whenever anybody says X, whatever X is, you say, well, why is X true? Is there a scenario where X is false, where Y is instead true? And you internalize that every argument has a counter argument and every counter argument has a counter counter argument, a synthesis. You internalize dialectic and you start thinking dialectically. And, um, you know, this is the sort of the funny thing about intellectuals. They never agree on anything. That's what makes them intellectuals. <laughs> uh, you know, it's sort of the, the uh, irony of like, uh, what would it be like to host a contrarian conference? It's like, um, you know, <laughs> most people, most of the real contrarians wouldn't even go. Um, but, uh, but there are sages one can look to. So one of the books that became kind of a Bible for me as a CEO was a book called Outsiders by William Thorndike. And uh, Thorndike, you know, had eight case studies, um, General Dynamics, Teledyne, Capital Cities, Washington Post, Berkshire Hathaway, and a few others. And all of them, there's a great graph where he's like, he shows the Fortune 500 uh, performance during the period of observation. And then he showed Jack Welsh above the Fortune 500. And then he showed the outsider CEOs just like out of scale, like just made Jack Welsh and the Fortune 500 look like a joke. And how did they do it? Well, one of the key strategies is buybacks. And so I started to think, oh, interesting. How come that's true? And, and I sort of became enamored with sort of fundamental analysis of companies, which uh, is, is um, very different than, you know, like, what, what's, the, what's the point of owning a company? Well, dividends, the primary function of, there's two, there's two primary functions of equity, like control and dividends. And then the secondary functions are the speculative functions, which we're very focused on, which are selling to somebody else, a secondary transaction, uh, an IPO, uh, an acquisition, which is another form of selling to someone else, or a buyback, which is the company buying you up. But the real primary functions are dividends. And how do you get dividends? Well, profits. It's like, you know, th there's these basic things that when you start thinking from first principles, and you almost have to have a childlike innocence to ask the dumb question, the emperor has no clothes question, to understand, like, why are things the way they are, instead of just sort of following the crowd. So yeah, I think, you know, it's sort of odd. I, you, you read a lot. You're, you're one of the most well-read people I know. 
like, what do you think of business books these days? You know, would you, do, when you're at, when you're at an airport, Brett, do you actually pick up the books there or do you do what I do and like, you know, go pick up some strategy book by a dead person like Sun Tzu and get more out of that? Yeah. I, I don't read many business books, but I mean, I, I do, I guess it seems to me that there is like, you are kind of varying in some humility, like your quote, like, you know, you, you look for incentives to see what the outcomes are going to be. I think that there is an incentive for the CEO of a company to raise equity from venture capital because they'll get they'll get well compensated out of that deal. Even if they blitz scale and then the company eventually blows up, they'll have liquidity rounds along the way. Isn't there in in some ways it's like it's it's actually maybe a less risky path for the CEO founder to go that route than to try to build something that that really is like a partnership and sustains, is it? Or, or am I mischaracterizing it? No, you're, you're right. So then why aren't you doing that? That would be the smart thing to do for you personally. I think at this point, it shifts from a conversation that's, uh, you know, about being a rational actor and about sort of strategic logic. And it moves more to a, a romantic conversation where, or an identity thing where it's like, I've got the curse being, you know, one of those round pegs and square holes type people, you know, like being a contrarian is, is, is not actually fun. And uh, it involves being misunderstood in all kinds of ways. It involves being wrong and sometimes being wrong, not in the way that other people think you're wrong, but in some way that only you end up realizing after the fact. Um, like, uh, you know, Jacques Lacan said, uh, thinking is a curse. And, and I think that there's a truth to that. Um, like, and so, yeah, I think, I think it's more of a, once you see something, it's difficult to unsee it. So part of this is long-term vision. I'm a bit of an idealist. So like now that business number one is profitable and we're scaling it and we're trying to make it more defensible, what are we going to do with all these profits? Well, we're going to do buybacks, but we're also going to take profits and start probably a loss-making business, a new second business, and take all the talent that we can't promote internally and we don't want them to leave. We're going to take them and move them into business number two. So we're going to recycle equity, recycle talent, recycle profits, build a second business, make that business profitable. Then we're going to take the profits in the first two business, build the third, have all these different business units and build this like holding company. And there's a lot of adjacent opportunities, what we're doing, but I, I never want to start another business again, if, if I can in my lifetime, because the inertia of like getting a business off the ground and building these network effects is very, very difficult. And I've got this vision for how to use technology for human potential and this first business has a mission of using you know, industrializing knowledge work, but that's not the only business I have in my, my, my mind. I've got these heroes like Thomas Edison and, and Steve Jobs and Walt Disney that had many gifts to give. Um, and I think that like, if we can sort of think about the corporation as an, an alignment technology and we could you know, align the, the capital and the talent around, around this and structure it, then, then we can do this amazing thing. But this amazing sort of, divergent vision just is like not possible as soon as you enter into a Harvard Business Review, follow these best practices, do this listicle, you know, like go to Y Combinator and then raise from one of these pre-seed funds and then raise from a seed fund and here are the terms and here's how to negotiate them and you go to the board meeting and you're, you, you have a boss and the boss is the board and you're not in control anymore. And if the board wants, they can fire you. And your job is just to grow top line and forget about bottom line. And, and it, and it may fail. And if it fails, it's fine as part of their portfolio risk. And, you know, it's just, it's, I can't contort myself to becoming that other person I would need to become to like actually be a good kid in class. Like I'm the, I'm the naughty kid in class who gets like, you know, goes to the principal's office. I just, I don't know what to do. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> well, it seems to be working. <laughs> regardless of how you hear you. It is interesting. I mean, you talk about like, you know, the corporation as an incentive alignment mechanism and a lot of kind of the philosophical concepts you're advancing, it seems like are getting embedded in kind of decentralized autonomous organizations and some of the cryptocurrency and smart contracting stuff. Is that an area that you would ever get interested in or have you even toyed with like that idea is, is an adjacent direction to move or, or is it outside of where you're looking? I'm incredibly interested in uh, crypto and decentralized approaches in general. A Marxist phrase is uh, the uh, only revolution that matters is the last revolution. And so it's like, you know, I, I don't necessarily want first mover advantage here. I'm okay with like learning from all the experimentation that's going on. And then if I see 
a model that works that I could apply with Invisible, I would. But I love the massive experimentation with with incentives and frameworks and protocols that that's going on. I I, I don't have further. I don't really have much. To say, I think the most interesting crypto company I know of, um, and full disclosure, uh, I'm a shareholder and a, a lifelong friend of the founder and CEO, Richard, is Numerai. Uh, Numerai is building like an AI hedge fund. And I think that he has innovated and then innovated on his innovation so many times over that I'm like, oh my God, this is just, even as like a, a work of art, like this bu- this business model, this company, the whole performance, uh, his performance as a CEO over the last five years is a kind of work of art, like stagecraft. It's just like, whoa, <laughs> I could try to pitch his company and explain why I think it's so freaking cool, but uh, that's a, it's a big rabbit hole and he does it better than I could anyways. I have him on my calendar, so I think I'm gonna Good. I'm gonna be talking to him soon, I think. Okay. Well this was like a whirlwind tour of Invisible in your philosophy. And it sounds like it's kind of a whirlwind, but in a positive, like upwelling sense right now. So um really appreciate you taking the time, Francis, to to Thanks share with us. Me, Brett. And um, you know, I will see you with some frequency going forward. I love having these conversations. So do I. Thank you. This was fun. Cheers. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.